I'm JJ Heller, and this is Instrumental, a show about the big and small moments that shape our lives. Big love happens in the small moments. Hi, everyone. It's JJ. Hi, everyone. It's her husband, Dave. Our guest this week is Jamie Ivey. That's such a nice name. I know. Rolls off the tongue. It really does. How did Jamie Ivey come to be on this show, JJ? I will tell you, Dave. So I have a friend named Elisa Keaton, and she was on Jamie Ivey's podcast, and she told me about it. And she was like, you need to be on Jamie Ivey's podcast as well because it's amazing. And I had never heard an episode before. Jamie Ivey's podcast is called The Happy Hour with Jamie Ivey. That's right. And so I looked it up and I started listening and sure enough, I loved it. And then I started talking about it and turns out there are a bunch of people in my book club who also listen to Jamie Ivey's podcast. Maybe you guys are a Jamie Ivey club and not a book club. A podcast club. Yes. We sit around and discuss podcasts. That would just be called a get together for you, Dave. I just talk about podcasts all the time. That's right. So turns out I was really late to the party and most of my friends already knew about Jamie Ivey's podcast. So the happy hour. The happy hour. So when she invited me to be a guest on it. On I, the happy hour? I was very honored and, and honestly a little bit nervous. But you know what? It's called the happy hour. She was super nice. You don't even have to be afraid. It's like, I guess this is going to be an hour of being happy. I know. And she was so Friendly. She's just really good at her job. It was a happy time. Nice. So now it's her turn to be on my podcast. We put her on the hot seat. That's right. And our show is not called The Happy Hour. No. It was intense. It kind of was intense because that day when we were in the studio, Dave and I had our backs to the window and Jamie and her publicist were facing the window and there was like a tornado warning. And so I'm sure they were looking over our shoulder at the trees, like swaying violently back and forth while trying to answer our questions. We were just having a lovely conversation. I I know. Fortunately, it wasn't. We all live to tell the tale. Fortunately, we all live (laughs) to tell the tale. And now you get to hear the tale. A whale of a tale. A whale of a tale. And when we did the interview way back in September, she had just released a new book. And now, as you listen to this episode today, she's getting ready to release a brand new book that she wrote with her husband about marriage called Compliment. Happy hour, compliment. She's just like full of joy and goodness. Yeah. I I think, though, compliment is about like we're complimentary yeah, like, like husband and wife. The two of us. Like we bring out the best in each other. Yeah. But I still like the word compliment. Yeah. Just saying. All right. Well, let's make this a happy hour and hear Jamie's story. <laughs> See what I did there? Uh, yeah, that was great. <laughs> Act three, you be you. Jamie's career is centered around stories, sometimes her own and sometimes the guests on her incredibly successful podcast. The happy hour. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. (laughs) Her growing influence in the podcast space opened the door for some exciting new opportunities as well. Let's hear from Jamie. My podcast launched before there was even a podcast app on your Apple phone. Wow. Okay. You're like one of the early YouTubers or like Instagram personalities or something. Yes. And so that really helped me have people who wanted me to write books with them. Yeah. I'm not the the best I didn't get an English degree you guys like I'm a <laughs> podcaster that has a kinesiology degree which means I was a coach okay I had an agent reach out to me and we had a conversation I ended up signing with her it's been a crazy ride since then what's it like to transition from podcaster to author well my favorite part of releasing books is doing what we're doing today <laughs> so I love the, <laughs> the I love the interviews part. how ironic <laughs> is that like I love the marketing the talking about it a lot of authors are like I hate marketing. I hate press. I'm like, I'll do your press for you. I'll do the interviews. Like, I just love it so much. And so the hard part for me is the discipline and the 
of sitting down and writing the words uh, that matter, that mean something, that are going to affect someone and hopefully help someone love Jesus more. That's like the hard part is just doing the work. I remember the very first time I got edits back on my very first book that I ever wrote. It was rough. Like it was rough, right? Like you look at it and you go, Okay, so that's we're a lot a, of reading. We're writing a different book <laughs> here. I see <laughs> this looks so, so it was rough, and I remember I, I cried, and I told my husband, and I said, I don't know why I'm doing this. Like I don't think I'm very good at this. I don't know why anyone asked me to do this. I don't know why I'm doing this because look at this. Like they must think this is awful. And he's a songwriter, and so you'll appreciate this example. He said, Jamie, whenever I come into the studio, and I bring a song. The song that comes out is different than the song I came in with. Hmm. He's like, everyone comes in and they bring maybe a new word or a new melody. And by the time we leave, we have a much better song than I ever could have walked in there with. Yeah. And it doesn't change the fact that 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 song I came in with was from my heart and it was real and it might have even been good. But it's so much better on the other side. And so I have learned that. And I'll tell you what, the second book, the editing process was so much easier because I now trust the process. Like now I go, okay, what I brought to the table is good. And you're going to make it a thousand times better. Yeah, this is the jumping off point. Yes. Now work your magic. Now work your magic. And we're going to do this together. And so it was my first experience of having someone kind of take what I'd done and go, we're going to move this and take this. And what are you actually talking about? And blah, 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 blah. Any kind of project, whether yeah. it's a book or a song or an album or a podcast, there's a lot of people that have their hands on that. Yeah. And so I learned that, and I'm really thankful for that. Collaboration is definitely a skill that you kind of have to learn because in the beginning, it feels so threatening. Because so you, threatening. Because you pour your heart and soul into something, and you present it, and you're like, ta-da! <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they're like, great, let's change this yes. and this and this and this. And, and it hurts, and it it's does. like, ugh. But then— After doing it, you realize, oh, my gosh, it's way better now than it was before. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad I've learned that. Can you tell us what it has been like to create this most recent book of yours? Yeah, this book was kind of birthed about probably a year and a half to two years ago. What I started to sense from women in my community and my church, women that I would see when I was on the road speaking, is they always felt less than, fill in the blank, someone else. Or they would think, if I could be, do, act, look more like her, then I'd be satisfied and then I'd be successful. Hmm. And so not only was I seeing this, you guys, I have felt this, especially creating stuff. I would think, okay, she did this for her book launch. If I do that, I will have a successful Hmm. book launch just like her. Well, oftentimes she's doing that because that's like a a skill set of hers. Like she can do that and I cannot do that. Right. And so I just started to see this and sense this and know that I've walked through that with like comparison and and envy and jealousy and discontentment. And I just wanted to write a book encouraging women to be who God created them to be. It's like kind of an overflow of my show because I want women to come on and tell your story. Like, I want to hear you. I want to know about you. And a lot of times women think their story doesn't matter or their story is not enough. And so this book, You Be You, is this encouragement to women to trust the gifts and talents, passions, influence, power, voice, everything that God has put in them, and to use that to bring him glory and make him known. That was the idea behind this book and what started the whole thing. Do you recall a moment of realization where you recognized that and went, I could write about that. I know that I've been through this. So I was friends with people that were doing what I'm doing now. And what I mean by that is they had, I'll use air quotes, like a platform or whatever. (laughs) It's weird. It doesn't make sense to me. But they were authors and speakers. And so then all of a sudden I have a podcast. And so I'm different than them. Like they don't have podcasts. I have a podcast. Um, But I start to get opportunity to do the same thing they're doing. And I had to learn really early that if someone invited Jamie Ivey in to do an event, that they actually wanted me to come. They didn't want me to come and pretend like I was someone else. Right. Every time I tried to do that, I left an event defeated, dissatisfied with my time, dissatisfied with myself, confused, feeling like a fraud and a phony because I didn't feel like I was giving them my best and giving them me. I felt like I was trying to give them what I thought they wanted, Mm -hmm. which maybe they want Jenny or Crystal or whatever, fill in the blank. And... They didn't. They actually invited me. 
And I've seen that in other areas besides just professionally, but even like personally, I look at some of my friends and I'm like, you're such a good mom. You do this so well. (laughs) I don't do that at all. And I have to trust, I do have to trust that that God knew what he was doing when he crafted me and when he gave me the kids that he gave me. And my kids are never, ever, ever going to have a craft night. We don't do craft (laughs) nights. So if they want a craft night, they're going to have to go to someone else's house. And I, that seems silly, but it's really true, is that I just had to believe that God didn't make his mistake when he gave me the things I enjoy to do and the things I don't enjoy to do and the influences that I have and the gifts and talents that I have. And I have to believe that my kids aren't missing out because they got me as a mom. And my podcast listeners are not missing out because I'm the host. Or the book readers are not missing out because they're reading a book by me. Because the truth is, like, my kids love me as their mom. And people buy the book and they know who the author is. It's not like a bait and switch, like, turn the page and, oops, (laughs) JK, you got the wrong book. Oh, man. Yeah. like Jamie (laughs) Ivey. I thought I was getting someone else. So I just really have had to fight through those. And I have a small suspicion that I might fight through those until I meet Jesus. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about finding yourself in the crowded podcast space? Because you were like an early adopter, Mm -hmm. and now the space has become crowded. Mm -hmm. What has that journey been like for you to sort of uh, remind yourself of your identity or your mission or whatever Mm -hmm. as that space gets crowded? Yeah. I remember the first time one of my peers started a podcast. A lot of my friends have podcasts now. Like like a women speaker or something? Yeah, Mm yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I remember the first time, and someone texted me and like, did you see that they're starting a podcast. How do you feel about this? And I was like, I feel amazing about this. I feel awesome about this. I never, and and I, I listen, I, I will air out Dirty Laundry. You guys know that. I, I'm not just saying this. I have never for a second been upset about the fact that the space is so crowded now. Has it affected my show? Hands down, 100%. You, you just do the math. There are only so many shows you can listen to in, in one week. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So have we seen it affect us? Yes. You guys have a show. Well, what if someone listens to your show today? It's the first time they've ever heard Jamie Ivey. And mm-hmm. so then they come listen to the happy hour. I now have a new listener. Yeah. But I also, here's the deal. I promise you guys, I'm so proud of the show that we put out. Yeah. I mean, it all depends on how you define your success. 100%. And if you're hearing meaningful feedback from your audience, if you're having meaningful conversations, then it feels like you're doing something that matters. It really does. And I, one of the things I'm the most proud about our show is that we push our listeners. I had Latasha Morrison on four years ago to talk about racial injustice. I've had people on to talk about immigration at the border in Texas. I've had people to come on and talk about same-sex attraction. I've had people come on and talk about politics. Like, we're not a political show, but just about how do we be Christ followers. We've pushed the envelope a little bit for, like, a, a Christian women's podcast. And... I am so proud of the show and of the listeners that send in messages and say, man, I've never actually thought about immigrants in the way that you talk about their journey of what might have got them here or why they might want to come to America. Or women who send in and they're like, I've never thought about the way this woman talked about same-sex attraction. You gave me a view of it that was a little bit more nuanced and helped me see what she might be thinking. I just love the opportunity to still be so gospel-centered and push people a little bit. I cannot say how proud I am of our listeners because I feel like they're willing to go there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I put shows out and, like, close my eyes and wait for the pushback. And there's some, for sure. But you can't push back very much with stories. Yeah. Someone's personal story that changes lives. Yeah, Yeah. you can't say, that didn't happen to you. (laughs) Exactly. That's not how you're feeling. That can't be true. Yeah. Man, stories are so powerful. And Jesus knew that. Yep, that's what he taught through stories all the time. On my show, I'm not even the main act. Like, I'm bringing stories to light. I'm bringing stories to the world. And that feels so honoring that people would trust me to hold space for what they're learning and Mm -hmm. then to send that out into the world. You know, I've interviewed hundreds of people, and there's a handful that stand out. And 
I'll interview someone and then the show comes out and I'm like, what did we talk about, you know? But then there are those ones that you never forget. I remember I interviewed a woman named Holly Hayes. She shared her story and she didn't grow up in the church. She um, was sex trafficked. She was an alcoholic. She stole a Bible from the library, read it alone in a bathroom, got sober, became a Christian, like changed her life. But she shared a story. She was talking about um, one of the times she had an abortion. And she said, I remember walking into that abortion clinic and there were women and men. They were outside and they were picketing and they were calling me names and they were calling me baby killer. And they were just screaming at me and yelling at me. She said, I walked into that abortion clinic. I had an abortion. She said, and then I walked out the back door and there was nobody there. Hmm. She said, where are the back door Christians caring for me after I went through that. She said there were none. She said they were only at the front screaming at me. And I've never, ever forgotten that. It's changed the way I think about a woman who might be going through a difficult situation I might not personally understand at the time, you know? So that, I mean, I remember that interview with Holly. It was profound. And um, I have enjoyed having conversations like that. One thing I I love about my show is being able to have conversations that, that push people a little bit that push them into a little different space of having to learn and listen. And that's one of those conversations that's really stood out to me. Do you remember the response to that episode? Great. Uh, I still have people today who remember that episode because that story is profound and you don't forget. It wasn't like she worked there. It wasn't like she was a, a journalist who did a story on it. She had an abortion in that clinic. She experienced what she experienced when she walked in. And the words that she said, where were the backdoor Christians? You can't stop but think, would I be in the front or would I be in the back? Yeah. Like, what kind of person am I? Yeah. Am I more concerned with someone's religiosity or whatever? Am I more concerned with that or am I a compassionate person who loves people right where they are? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a question we'll have to ask. And she did that through her story. And I've never forgotten it. Do you feel like you would have had a conversation like that if you hadn't been on mic having her as a guest? I think I'm the kind of person that that likes to have those conversations. I think one of the reasons that my show has been successful is because people can sit down and share things with me. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how many times people have said, I've actually never told that story before. And I'm like, oh, good, you know, and it's not because I'm here trying to get TMZ news or anything. It's just because you feel safe and you feel like someone's actually holding space for your story. And so I think I do have those conversations. Now, the show has led me to having a lot more conversations than the amount of people I have in my life. I don't have 800 friends. Yeah, (laughs) Like I I just need four or five and I'm good, you know, and so – But I am a person who likes to really understand people's story and where they come from because I think when you know things about people – it changes the way you see them a little bit and helps you understand them. Yeah. But I always need to remind people that the stories and the struggles that I'm walking through, the people I'm walking through those with are my community. I'm walking through those with my girlfriends every day. So just if someone is feeling intimidated by the fact of, okay, so I guess I got to write a blog post and lay it all out there. <laughs> I got to get on a podcast. I got to, the answer is no. It's just the, it's what we, the world we live in and work in. But there are things that I'm working with my friends right now of struggles in my life that I'm not telling you about because right. I'm working through it with my community. And so I always think that people can get intimidated by the fact when I say stories change the world and your story matters and you have the opportunity to point people to Jesus through your story. They're like, I don't know. I, don't, I can't <laughs> do this. I'm like, but you can. You can in the communication that you have with the people around your dinner table, with your neighbors, with your community, with your church. Like those little moments matter. Yeah, you need to start with the safe people in your yep. life mm-hmm. and, and then see, like, if if God opens the door for, right. for maybe tell some more people yep. and then maybe tell more people. Yep. But it's not it's not mandatory that everybody posts right. <laughs> everything yes. in their life on the Internet. All their yeah. dirty laundry. <laughs> All their dirty, my, in my first book, I tell this whole story a million times longer of things that happened when I started following Jesus. And the question all the time was like, was this really hard for you to write? And the answer was like, no, because I dealt with this a long time ago. Yeah. Like this is like, now if you want to know what I'm struggling with today, I'm not going to tell you because that's hard and I'm still working through it. So yeah. That's 
some wisdom right there. It makes so much sense to work through difficult seasons with your own community. A lot of the time you can turn social media into a bit of a journal and it feels safe to share your pain and your grief and your problems with the anonymous internet. But those people don't know you and they're not doing life with you day in and day out the way that your neighbor or your family or your best friend would be. Well, I mean, I think if you're going to share those deep personal things on social media, you also need to be sharing it with people in your own life. I actually think when you're sharing things on social media that you need to have already worked through them. That's normally a, a good course of action. Yeah, you 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 share them because you're on the other side and it's helping someone else instead of looking for anonymous help. You always kind of need to check your motivation. Like if you're going to your social media audience hoping that they will be your counselor or your therapist or just give you a pat on the back, then that's not really a healthy situation. Also, can we talk about the happy hour for just a second? Oh, man. I love the guests that she's had on her show. I mean, talk about cultivating a safe place for people to share the life that they've already processed. Mm -hmm. They're having hard conversations, but in a safe context, because Jamie's been through a lot as well. Yeah, I love how brave she's been in the subject matter that she's tackled on her show. There's this Mr. Rogers quote that says, Frankly, there isn't anyone you couldn't learn to love once you've heard their story. I think I'd like to have him for a neighbor. I know. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> P.S. If you have not seen the documentary about him called Won't You Be My Neighbor, you must go make it a priority to watch that. It's incredible. I mean, I thought Mr. Rogers was a nice guy, but after seeing that documentary, he's kind of my hero now. Seriously. In order to start our next act, we need to go back in time to 2011. JJ, what was going on with you in 2011? Oh boy, I was pregnant with Nora Grace. She was born on September 2nd in 2011. We were living in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. It was so hot during my third trimester, and I would spend so much time in the pool, but it was kind of my saving grace. All I remember is that we were getting ready to buy a tour bus in the summer of 2011, and I know that you were really nervous about the arrival of Nora. Yes, and how it would shape our family. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I was just way more stressed out about the arrival of our tour bus. <laughs> yes, the other addition to our family. And how it would shape my psychological well-being. Yes, but we bought the bus. Everything kind of worked out. Yeah, it was crazy, but so good. I'm glad we got both of them, and we got rid of one of them. I'll let you guess what <laughs> we got rid of. We eventually got rid of one of them. <laughs> well, things were about to change drastically in the Heller household in 2011, and Jamie Ivey was about to step into a season of change as well. Act two, I'm going to make this a job. Jamie feels very comfortable in front of a microphone, but she had to start somewhere. Her first chance to talk on the air came through a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I'll let Jamie explain. As much as I adore being a mom, like I love it, and I was a stay-at-home mom at the time, I, I went through a lot of times of wondering, is this the gig I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. The um, full-time mom gig? The full-time mom gig. And I now know the ability to be a stay-at-home mom is a privilege. Yeah. Like, it is not an option for a lot of women. Mm -hmm. And so even when I look back on that time, I'm like, Jamie, there were so many times that you missed the unique opportunity that you had in that season. So I'm driving in the car. I am in Austin, Texas. I remember exactly where I was. I'm at really? the corner of 35 and 183. I'm about to turn <laughs> left and go on to 183. I'm probably taking my kids to preschool. Okay, here I am. And I'm listening to the morning show of this country radio station that I listened to because I loved it. They played old country. And they had an announcement on there that they were going to have an open casting call for the next newest member of the morning show. 
they already had two guys on the show. They were going to fill the spot with a third person. And y'all, I cannot explain to you how much I just thought, now that would be fun. Hmm. That's what it was. Like, that would be fun. So I take my kids to school. I get home. And I also remember this so much because my husband had the flu. So I come into the house. I've taken the kids to school. I come in, and he is sick. And I'm like, babe, I heard this. And he's like, what? And I was like, you have to help me record a 60-second demo. (laughs) Okay, now, when I say that to you guys, that makes sense. I had never spoken into a microphone before this point. So my husband sick as he was, finally because he loves me. We had a studio. We had a a duplex. We had a studio in our back house. We walked back to the studio. I'm sure we had to record that thing 38 times for me to get 60 seconds to try to sell myself. I sent it in, and it just became this long process where I just kept being in the top whatever. So I made the top 10 by votes. How did you – oh, yeah. I mean, it's like, is this online? It was voting, which – 10 years ago, I need you to know, I did not have an Instagram. I did not do what I do now. I was getting votes because we went to a very large church. And so, you know, the sad (laughs) part about the whole thing is I think people voted for me and they didn't even listen to my demo. (laughs) So this is sad. It pays to be nice to people. It pays to be nice to people, you guys. So I was getting votes and votes and votes. I made it to the top 10. And then once you made it to the top 10, the executives picked the top five. I got chosen to be part of the top five. And then we each got a day to go in, and I went in on a Thursday, and I did the morning show with the guys. And I left that Thursday morning, and I said, if I don't win, that was the coolest experience. Like, you'd be Mm -hmm. like if you got to go do a cool job for a day. Yeah. That's how I left. And I went home, and I remember thinking, if I don't get the job, I'll be sad because, of course, I wanted it. But I wasn't going to be overtly sad because it was very clear that I don't know what I did to deserve that job. Mm -hmm. Nothing. I didn't have a degree. I'd never worked in radio. I was never an intern at a radio station. Like, you guys, I did not deserve that job. You were not qualified. I was not qualified (laughs) for that job. And so the sadness would have just been like, oh, man, that would have been fun. Yeah. I had entertained, what if I got this job? (laughs) It feels weird saying this now, but it felt like it was going to put me in a little glimpse of the outside world because I felt like I was drowning at home with kids. Mm -hmm. Our family. We have four kids. Um, Three of them joined our family through adoption. And so this would have been, I'm going to be probably off a little bit, but maybe like March, April of 2011. My final child had come home January of 2010. Okay. Okay. So we had just become a complete family for about 15 months. And he was four and a half when he came home. He was born in Haiti. And so that year, 2010, might go down as the hardest year of my life. Hmm. What happened yeah. when the phone rang? Yeah, the phone rang, and it was the station. We lived in East Austin at the time and a very busy neighborhood. So I stepped out of the loud to step into a different loud. If that makes <laughs> yeah. sense. So it wasn't like I was like, oh, it's quiet out here. But I remember I'm a pacer. Like when I'm on the phone, if I'm having like a serious conversation, I'm a pacer. I pace up and down our yard with four acres. I've walked the whole thing, Mm -hmm. solving all the world's problems, you guys. (laughs) Uh, So I'm pacing in our little driveway. And the cutest thing, I don't know why this is about to make me cry. The cutest thing is I remember that we had these big windows on the front of our house. (laughs) Why am I crying about this? I've never even shared this part of the story. It's kind of dumb after I say it. And my whole family was looking out the window. Mm at me and it was almost like they were so proud and she was like three my daughter there's no clue what was about to happen but my husband was so proud of me and I felt like I haven't really done anything you guys I just won a contest but that gave me a lot of confidence that I could leave the house because I had not worked full time for since 2003 wow and so that was a, it was a sweet moment because I felt super cheered on by my family. And I, I think I give a lot of credit of that to my husband because it could not have been calm and collective in the house early in the morning. We're all trying to get ready for school. If anyone has children, those are like some of the hardest hours. Yes. Because <laughs> we're like, where are your shoes? Why don't you have this? Eat something. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like he intentionally took the time to make our whole family cheer for mom mm-hmm. as she won this job. That really, looking back, I mean, nine years, it changed my entire career. It changed Mm -hmm. everything for me, was that one job. You were talking about how you were already saying, like, am I doing the right thing if I'm leaving my kids? But it sounds amazing. Uh And so to just see 
all of their faces yeah. lined up in the window yeah. just saying like, mom, this is amazing. Yeah. You like go do this. Yeah. It felt really good. I felt really cheered on. And I start Monday morning and we're live at 6 a.m. I've never done radio, never talked into a microphone. Like they, during the first commercial break, they were like, hey, you're breathing really hard. <laughs> <laughs> to the yeah. like, well, like, there's Darth Vader voice in here. So I had to learn so much. And those guys were so kind to me uh, to bring in this woman who they're probably thinking, this is the dumbest idea our executives have ever thought of. Because you're bringing in somebody who has no Some clue what they're doing. A newbie. Yeah. But that job was really, really, really something special to me. Um, I know people who work for morning shows. And I see – what time their alarm is yeah. set for. Mm-hmm. And so when you were on the freeway, were you thinking like, oh, 345, wake up call? What was that like to, uh-huh. on the one hand, have the fun, but I'm, I'm sure it was really hard right. to pull yourself up out of bed? You know how you, like, you're about to embark on something that you're so excited about and someone's already done it and they tell you all of the awful things about it and you say, oh, those things won't bother me. Like, I don't care about those things. And I never, ever entertained the thought that it might be difficult to work on a morning show. It just seemed like this fun adventure. And so, no, I never thought about that until, <laughs> you know, a couple of weeks before the con- in the middle of the contest, my husband Aaron and I went on a date. And he was like, um, so I think that we should talk about what happens if you might win this job. Because I'm the sole caregiver during the day. I mean, my husband has a job. My husband traveled at the time, too, all the time. And he's a musician, He's right? a musician. Yeah, he's a pastor. And at that time in our lives, he was still also traveling often okay. doing solo things. So I was like, listen, babe, we both know I'm not going to get this job. So let's not even talk about it. And we didn't. <laughs> because it was to me, it was like, listen, I'm not, I don't want to think about it and talk about it. But those mornings were, it was early. We went live at 6 a.m., like most morning shows. And so getting there early, for me as a mom, when Aaron was out of town, I had to have someone show up at my house at like 4.45. Wow. Because I couldn't leave my, now, if it was now with my kids, peace out. They're fine. Yeah. You know, they're big. You should have seen the, like, spreadsheet I had to create to get people coming and going. It was so much work. I believe it. Uh Yeah. Now, let me tell you, the first couple weeks, I showed up with, like, my hair done and makeup on and looking cute. By about three weeks in, I realized this is not a TV show, people. <laughs> and so <laughs> we, I like literally would like roll out on my, in front of my microphone, I had like coffee and water and juice. And it was like one big drink bar around me. <laughs> and then about by like eight o'clock, 9.30, I'd put my makeup on in commercials and then I'd be ready to go. But yeah, I soon learned I did not need to show up camera ready. Yeah. Yeah. You're like this is audio only. <laughs> audio only people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But what happened when I started working was I felt like I'd found my lane. I loved my job. I loved the people I worked with. From the hours of 5 to 1 p.m., I was living my best life. Hmm. And I loved it so much. And then I would come home. And it's not that home was bad, but it was just difficult for my kids, all four of them. We have a different babysitter every day. Mom's not here. Dad's out of town. Who do I see when I wake up in the morning? It just, everything started to crumble right before my eyes. Mm -hmm. It was hard on our marriage. I mean, I get home at one. If I take a nap and then I stay, it just, you guys, it was difficult. And it can be done. It could have been done. But I had a really big come to Jesus moment about three months in where I came to my husband and I said, I don't think I can do this anymore. I said, it feels really hard at home. And he's like, you think? <laughs> like, <laughs> and I look back on that. And one of the things I'm most thankful for is that Aaron didn't come to me mm. and say, you have to quit. Yeah. But I could have understood his tension of feeling like, I think we need you here at home. Yeah. But he was probably feeling the tension of how do I tell my wife who's now discovering she loves something we need you here. And so he didn't. And I've never actually even asked him why he didn't. I should. But hmm. I said, I I think I need to quit. It was a moment. Like, we invited some friends over. Man, I just laid it out. Like, I don't think I can work and raise children at the same time right now. And I felt like a failure. Hmm. I felt like a bad mom. A little bit, maybe a lot angry at God as to I didn't look for this. Yeah. It feels as though you orchestrated this whole thing, and I don't know why you would do that if you only intended me to be here for four months. Yeah. So 
I quit. And I always say it was the hardest, best thing I've ever done because mm-hmm. I would do it again. I really would give up everything for my family. But it was really hard because I really liked that job. Um, so I quit. What transpires in between that and you deciding to start the podcast? A lot transpired. It's crazy. That station all rearranged at the end of the year. They were all gone by the end of the year. Whoa. And so it was kind of like, okay, this was going to kind of happen anyways. Yeah, you kind of like dodged a bullet. I dodged a bullet a little bit. And I don't know what would have happened to me, but maybe a year later, they started a new station. And so they asked me if I wanted to come over. And I was a little nervous talking to Aaron about it because I thought he was going to be like, we've been down this road and it didn't work. So this is a no. But we talked about it and I was just like, I don't think I'm supposed to do this. And so I never went back to radio, even though I had that opportunity. But it did. I just kept wondering, like, will I ever do this again? And then it became when all my kids are going to school, then I'll go back into radio. That's kind of what it looked like. But it was about probably 2013, somewhere around there. Someone invited me to be a guest on their podcast. And honestly, you guys, I don't remember why they invited me because I was like, I don't know what I was doing (laughs) that they needed to talk to me (laughs) on the podcast. (laughs) But we chatted. Oh, you know what? That's not true. I remember I did a blog series and it was like 12 months of theme nights at home. This cracks me up because I am so not domestic, (laughs) but I was trying so hard and I did 12 months and we did a theme night every month at our house. So she asked me about that. So we're having this conversation on the podcast and I got done recording the show with her. And I remember specifically thinking, I think I can do what she just did. Hmm. I can have that feeling, that experience that all three of us are feeling right now. We're all speaking into a microphone. We're telling stories. We're encouraging people. And so in 2014, I launched a podcast. And when I say I launched the podcast, what I mean by that is I called my best friend and we chatted and I hit record and then I put it online. (laughs) You're like, episode one. Episode one. (laughs) Me and my friend chatting. And that's exactly what it was. Um, But I started it and I I still have the same name. I mean, way different logos and way more purpose to it and so much have changed. But that was six and a half years ago. How did it end up unfolding? I thought it was a hobby, and it was a fun outlet for me. I was able to work on it when my daughter was at preschool, and so it was just kind of like, oh, this is fun for me. I saw episode 50 coming, and I thought, I think I'm going to do this like I'm going to make this a job. If you're releasing once a week— Which I need you to know I wasn't releasing once a week. Yeah, I I was releasing— when do I think about it? So it was a while is what you're getting to. <laughs> now you are guaranteed to get a happy hour at 6 a.m. on Wednesday and Friday. I don't care where I am. That will happen. Then I'm like, I'm going to put a show out tomorrow. And then Aaron's like, do you want to watch TV tonight? I'm like, yeah, I'll put the show out on Friday. <laughs> I mean, that's the, kind of, that's the kind of show I was producing yeah. over here. It was so just a hobby. What's the span of time between episode one and episode 50? Is this like two years? No, it probably was maybe uh, maybe a, a year and a couple months. Okay. It was definitely episode 50 where I thought I'm going to start selling ads. So I did it all on my own, started selling ads. So I started having like, you know, a couple of pennies come in for advertising, hired an editor, quit doing the editing because I'm really bad at it <laughs> and started to be consistent with it. And consistent was like, this is going to come out on a weekly basis. And I'm going, to, I just started to do the things that I do now, just on a much smaller scale. About that time as well, I decided that I needed a purpose. Like I needed, I need a reason why I do this because it's fun to talk into a microphone and it's fun to say you have a podcast, but that stuff can't sustain you for a long time. Like who cares, right? And so I needed a purpose. And it was for me, I decided I want to make shows that point people to Jesus, encourage women, and inspire them to do big things. This also opened up the door for me to, like, go speak places. And I remember where I was when I got the first email that someone wanted me to come speak. And they were going to put me on an airplane. And they were going to pay me and put me in a hotel room. And I was like, (laughs) this is the best job I've ever had in my whole life. Like, vacation on your dime. I mean, this is great. One of the first conference I went and spoke at, I was doing, this is even more fun, this is even funnier, is that I was doing a podcasting breakout. So they must have thought I was doing something well. <laughs> but as I got to the lobby, people started coming up to me and telling me what the show meant to them. Wow. And you guys know what I'm about to say because we're all sitting in this room and there's the three of us plus my friend Christina. We're alone when we do this. Like we don't see the listener. Yeah, It's not like you're performing on a stage. We create an art that goes out And you have no idea what happens to it. You have no idea who consumes it. You have no idea what they look like. You have no idea 
what they're going through. Like you just put something out into the air, it seems, the internet, and there it is. Now, again, they can leave reviews, they can send you emails, all the things. But it was at that conference that people came up to me face to face and told me what my show meant to them. And I was overwhelmed. I mean, so overwhelmed, you guys, that I, after about 30 minutes, took myself up to the hotel and got in the bed. I was like, I am (laughs) spent with this. But I look back and I think that was really, really, really encouraging for me because it wasn't my mom telling me. It wasn't my friends. You know, it was strangers looking at me and saying, your show matters to me. And that was a moment where the other things that happened at that conference were literary agents and editors were having meetings with me. And I just cannot tell you how much, like, I did not know what I was doing. I was like, what do I even do? Like, I don't know how to have these meetings. What do I say? They're not going to like me, all the things. And I went into the room like I, and, I, and I got into the bed and I called my husband. And I said, I can't do this. I can't do any of this. I cannot do talking to people. I cannot do people recognizing me. I cannot write a book. I cannot have another meeting. I cannot do this. It's too stressful. And he said on the phone, he said, you need to get yourself out of that bed, put your clothes back on and go back downstairs. <laughs> no joke. Like I was like, I needed sympathy from him. And he was like, you need to get up. Put on your big girl pants. Put on your big girl (laughs) pants and go back downstairs. I wanted him to be like, oh, baby, I'm so sorry. You take a nap and everything will be good when you wake up. But no, he knew what I didn't know of I could handle that. Like, did that end up with you landing your first book deal? None of those meetings panned out into anything that you see today. Okay. In fact, I had a meeting with someone and I left that meeting and I thought to myself, This is me telling myself, I have never heard you speak more poorly in my entire life, Jamie. Like, I literally was like word vomit of things that don't even make sense. (laughs) It was a train wreck, you guys. But again, I wasn't I wasn't setting these meetings up. And so to me, it just felt like you get what you get. That was a train wreck, you guys. Like, I don't know what happened. And but I was doing my podcast like my podcast was my number one gig. And so at that time, would it be fun to write a book? Awesome. Yes. But here's my focus. Yeah. And so the funny story is the agent that I ended up signing with, the guy I had the word vomit train wreck with, that was her boss. <laughs> and so the first time I saw him, I was like, don't remember me. Please don't remember me. Please don't remember me. And when he said that he didn't remember me, I did not tell him that I had had the word vomit train wreck in front of him. Oh, that's good. Oh, I kept that to myself. <laughs> that will go with me and everyone listening <laughs> to the grave. But but I just learned a lot. And I, I think one of the things that that weekend taught me is – There's this idea, this desire for fame that people have, and we were never created for fame. And I learned that weekend that for a split second, I felt really important when those people come up to me. Mm -hmm. I always say, please come say hi, because we do this job in a room all by ourselves. And so Mm -hmm. I need to see you and hug you and do all the things. Um, When I left that conference, I went home. You know what I did when I went home? I probably did 17 loads of laundry. Right. You know, and I was like going to the store to buy football gloves for somebody. I mean, it is a big part of my life, but my real life, the things that really matter at the end of the day happen in my house with my people. is the weirdest ever. It's really strange. I mean, like I saw this documentary once and it was about one of the pioneers of early skateboarding and he would do these different skateboard exhibitions and when he would show up, he was just like a really big deal in the room that he was doing all of these tricks in. And like people would ask for his autograph. People would hound him and yeah, and want photos and all of that. And he could walk into the very next room and no one would care. I think what's really great though is no matter how famous you are, I think kids are kind of the great equalizer. You come home from that conference or the concert or viral social media posts or something, and you interact with your kids and they don't care. Like they just want to know that you love them, and they're not impressed by all your achievements. Hey, sweetheart, mom got 30,000 likes today. (laughs) Okay, I like you too. Uh, Yeah, blink, blink, blink. Dinner, please. Act one of Jamie's story begins back in the mid-90s. JJ, one of your favorite movies of all time was made in 1995. Was it really? Yeah. 
The remake of Sabrina with Harrison Ford. I love that movie so much. And it's really boring. Well, kind of like White Christmas. Yeah, but it's so good. Why is it and good? I, well, the music is really good. Mm. And it's kind of like a uh, transformation happens. Oh, it is. It's a makeover movie. Uh, yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. You know what else is a makeover movie? What? Braveheart. That is a lie. He starts as a boy and then like eventually he's a grown up wearing war paint. And a kilt. Yes. Well, he was probably wearing a kilt as a boy too. Oh, that's true. Oh man, talk about awesome music. I hear the bagpipe and the opening line of that soundtrack and I almost start crying immediately. Is that real? Yeah. It's just like, it makes me weepy. It is really good. What's that part that you always quote? Well, I I kind of quote it to give it context. So the first part is kind of a a misquote, but he's hanging out with with his girlfriend and he talks about how much he loves her. And she's like, are you saying you want to marry me, William? And he says, it's a bit sudden, but all right. (laughs) Well done. Thank you. So Braveheart, Apollo 13 came out in that area. Sabrina. Yeah. And Jamie Ivey was in high school. That's right. Doing her high school thing. Yep. Let's hear about it. Act one, this wasn't an accident. Part of the reason why Jamie's show is so engaging is because she's an empathetic listener. She gives space for her guests to tell their story without fear of judgment or ridicule. You're about to hear how the brokenness in Jamie's story gave her the ability to be a safe place for others. This act includes a letter to her younger self, two old ladies in their 30s, and a major change of plans. Early on in my, like I'm sitting down to tell a story. Sit down, children. Early when I was a teenager. Um, tell us, Miss Were there dinosaurs? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I grew up in a Christian home. So I grew up going to church my whole entire life. It was, I don't ever remember not going to church. We went to Wednesday night church, Sunday night church, GAs, all the things. All the church. All the church. <laughs> um, and so I knew a lot about Jesus. And I would have said that I was a follower of his, that I was a Christian. I walked down the aisle when I was younger. But I didn't live for him at all once I hit high school. It was like I had this opportunity to kind of do whatever I wanted in a rebellious spirit to my parents, but also I could act churchy. Like I could go to church. I was actually president of FCA. I could do it when I needed it. But then I also had this other life. And so I lived this double life. I went off to college and kind of threw out the church hat and just lived me, which I thought was fine. I was not murdering anyone. I wasn't doing drugs. I'm a kind person. I just had a little bit more fun than maybe I should have (laughs) as a, you know, 18 year old. And my sophomore year in college, I ended up getting pregnant. And so here I am, I'm at a small private Christian university. Hmm. I now am pregnant and I don't know what to do. I told my parents I was going to marry the guy. They rightly so flipped out. Um, as a mom now to a 16, I understand the flip out. Um, <laughs> but that was kind of this, oh, everything I've been doing that I thought I was invincible for has now caught up for me. And so I ended up um, having a miscarriage, but moved home with my parents. And so moving back in with my parents, I then went to church with them because that's just what we did. And then I went to Passion in 1999 and actually met Jesus. And my life was changed, and I've been following Jesus ever since. But what happened after I became a Christian is that as I would tell these older women in my life, which older is funny because they're younger they were younger then than I am now, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. These old ladies <laughs> who were in their early 30s. 30s. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, ancient. <laughs> ancient women. They were, they were parenting littles, and I was a you know, young college kid. And I would talk with them about my story, these, especially these two women in particular. And I felt really ashamed of things that I had happened to me and things that I've done. And you know, premarital sex and sex outside of marriage is not God's best plan for our life. It's not what he wants for us. He has a better way, a better plan. The thing that was hard is that I knew a lot of people that were doing that, but they just never got pregnant. Right. And so then I had this shame of being pregnant. 
And I would talk with these ladies about it. What were their names, by the way? You said there were two of them? I thought you meant the people that shamed me. I was like, I'm not doing that. Hey, come on. Let's get a list. (laughs) Write it out. Um, um, (laughs) Write them out. Yeah. uh, Amy Goen and Carrie Oglesby. So Amy and Carrie. Amy and Carrie were God sent to me because I could be myself with them. I could tell them all the things I'd been through. And never one time did they make me feel shamed for that. Hmm. Never. In fact, they believed in me that I could do great things. Like I worked at Canacuck one summer. Which is a camp. A Christian sports camp. And I don't know why they hired me, except for Carrie put a good word in for me. And the reason she did is because she saw more of me than just the girl who got pregnant in college. Hmm. Well, she's being a backdoor Christian. She was being a backdoor Christian. She was. Those women held space for me at a time when I didn't think I deserved space. Hmm. Now, I was not by any means in a place where I could have like sat down and shared my story like I do now. This comes complete ease. Listen, I got a long list of sin in my life. That was 20 years ago, you know? And so I, th- those things, it's not hard for me to talk about this. Yeah. But at the time, it was very hard. And then I started dating a guy who worked at a church. I actually, you guys, was my husband now. His name is Aaron. I was his first kiss. Wow. So just I felt unworthy in a lot Mm. of ways, and they never let me sit in that or feel that way. And so I look back and I think they really allowed me to be me and saw things in me that weren't just my sin or my struggle or where I had been through or what I had done. So Mm. fast forwarding to you sitting in the podcast booth, how do you think the way that Amy and Carrie – treated you and modeled for you, how has that embodied itself as you're sitting across from a podcast guest? Yeah. I wrote a blog series on my blog, and it was called Letters to Your Younger Self or something like that. And one of them was about that pregnancy in college. And I wrote a letter to myself about how things would be okay. I can't remember what I said, but I said to the world that I was pregnant in college. And I'd never said it publicly. Not my friends, community. It was like I had already been working through that. I'm married with four kids at this time. It wasn't like it wasn't a tell all. Right. I just never put on the internet, you yeah. know, which I, I'm you don't have to put your thing on the internet, you guys. But for me, it was a space <laughs> where I was communicating, you know. And I'll never forget a woman from my church, she sent me an email and she said, I read your blog. And I had an abortion when I was younger, and I've never even told my husband. Wow. I've never told anybody. And she said, I really think that if you can say that out loud and you accept your grace and your forgiveness and your husband, to her it was a big deal. She's like, and your husband's a pastor at our church, then I feel like I can talk to my husband about this. Hmm. And it was in that moment that I remember thinking, our stories have power. Our stories have power because what I did there was she wasn't actually applauding Jamie Ivey for writing that. She was saying, I believe in the God that you believe in. I believe I can experience that same grace and forgiveness that you did. That was big for me because that's why I love people telling their stories because I think stories change the world. I think that when we are vulnerable with our stories, it gives people a glimpse into not just me as a person, but as to what has God done in my life. Every time I sit and interview somebody, every single time, it's crazy. You can have thousands of people listen to your show. And people will listen and have nothing in common with that person. And they're like, I felt that same way before. Mm-hmm. We forget how much we have in common with each other. Yeah. Even all, even in the story I, just, I told you about my friend Holly with the abortion, I've only by the grace of God, because I'm not above it and clearly got pregnant in college, I've never had an abortion. But I understand those two dynamics that she was talking about. And I felt both of them at different times. And so I think even me sharing my story and that girl sending me the email, it was this moment of going, okay, this isn't about me. I can do this and point people to Jesus the whole entire time. Yeah. I think that's so powerful, especially in the church community. Sometimes we feel this pressure to be perfect right? because we look around us and it seems like everybody else is perfect. Yeah. And so you being willing to be vulnerable and saying like, hey, look, I got pregnant in college. Yeah. Like that's so inspiring to somebody else because it, it kind of reveals your humanity. Mm-hmm. And then to say like, and God has grace for yeah. me and yeah. God has grace for you. Yeah. 
And it just kind of gives us all permission to just breathe a sigh of relief. Yeah. And and realize that we don't have to be perfect. Right. Because that's Jesus's job, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. The example that Carrie and Amy set for you in providing a safe place, a safe listening ear, acceptance, no matter what you've done, if you hadn't experienced that in such a formative time in your life, do you feel like your writing and your podcast would be what it is today? Absolutely not. No way would I be who I am or be able to pour out the way I do to encourage women to own their stories and believe in their stories and trust God with their stories if I didn't experience that myself Hmm. early, early on in my walk with the Lord. Because that's not the only thing I've had to own and walk through. I mean, I've been following Jesus for 20 years. There's been a lot of other things. That was the first major thing that happened to me. And that gave me the opportunity to understand that I am not the things I've done I am not the ways I've messed up. Uh, It helped me learn to trust in my identity, and that's one of my biggest messages to women. Where do you think you would be if you didn't have those people in your life? My goal and our plan was when our daughter went off to kindergarten for me to go back to being a teacher and a coach. Yeah, that was the plan. But I, I believe true in God's, like, sovereignty over our lives. I think this is what I was always supposed to do. Like, I don't think there's a way that I wouldn't have been doing this. This wasn't like an accident. I think this is what God wanted me to do all along. That is so beautiful. I mean, think of all the things that had to happen in her life to get her to where she is right now. I wonder if Braveheart plays into her story at all. (laughs) No, I don't think so. (laughs) Does it play into your story, Dave? I mean... A little bit. I kind of feel like it does. Okay. Well, we're about to wrap up this episode, but before we do, we have a segment we like to call... (gasps) Let's Let's Rewind rewind the Tape! (laughs) Jamie is a wife, mother podcast host and author with a mission to encourage and empower women. Her platform as an author wouldn't exist without the time and hard work she put into developing her hugely successful podcast, The Happy Hour with Jamie Ivey. But her podcast would not have happened if she hadn't won a contest to be a radio DJ in 2011. Which may never have happened if Jamie hadn't first learned self-love and empathy and compassion when she was in college from two old ladies in their 30s named Amy and Carrie. To find out more about Jamie, visit jamieivy.com. That's J-A-M-I-E-I-V-E-Y.com. This episode of Instrumental was produced by me, JJ Heller. And me, Dave Heller. Our theme music is my song, Big Love, Small Moments. That I helped write. (laughs) To find out more about me, listen to more of my songs, or watch my music videos, please visit jjheller.com. That's two letter J's, H-E-L-L-E-R.com. We'll be back next week with another episode of Instrumental. So be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.